you. Thank you. I know that you are set. I know that you are ready. And I know that you're prepared. With your book, your pen, your mind, your focus. Are you all here with all that? Then with Jesus' joy, help me celebrate and bring on the stage my father, my mentor, our pastor, Dr. Abel Damina. Are you celebrating at all? Glory. Glory. Amen. Amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, we rejoice that we are found in you complete in you and we rejoice that we have access into the deep things of God by the Holy Ghost so we speak words which the Holy Ghost teach it comparing spiritual with spiritual and we rejoice that we are spiritual men so we receive the things of the spirit and we take of the spirit we take from the spirit as we minister to your people this afternoon grace abounds in this house everyone under the sound of my voice is strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man and we rejoice that by the end of this session, we'll all be the better for it. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together. As we say these words, I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore, today... I will understand the word of his grace I will be built up by the end of this service I will never be the same never ever be the same again in Jesus name and every believer sees a powerful amen can we celebrate Jesus with a shout glory to God whoa amen you can be seated with your sweet smart self this afternoon hallelujah a lot of teaching is going on here right are you learning are you growing is everything getting clear praise god that's the whole intent of putting this conference together and we intend to do much more the next one week as we are with you here you know we're going to do a lot more we're going to pour as much as we can pour into you and as much as you can take we're going to make all available to you uh, I'm sure you, you, you heard the announcement, you know, uh, within the week we're available to do some counseling for those of you who need some clarity on certain things in your own personal life. And uh, also we, we have the Power Bible School. For those of you that were not aware who wants to be part of it, you can talk to Pastor Vincent immediately after this session. Pastor Vincent will know how to package you to, so that tomorrow you can be in class. We teach every day from morning till evening. And it's going to continue tomorrow. And then... Um, we also want to start a discipleship class for those of you that have never been discipled by somebody. Because you can't disciple somebody if nobody has discipled you. So we like to do a discipleship school while we are still here. Because um, we may not always have two weeks to stay in South, I, I mean in East Africa. We may not always have that kind of time. So now that we have the time, we must use the time. Is that true? We must use the time. Otherwise, if you don't use the time, you will have to buy a ticket and come to Nigeria. And come and get some of the things that has come to you in Nairobi for free. See that. So, already there are people, you know, there are people that are relocating from different countries to come and live in my city for the world. From different countries. A family just sent a mail to our office asking our office to advise that they want to move from Turkey, the whole family, with their business to my city for the word they are hearing. That they want to be right where the word is taught. Amen. We have people moving from different states in Nigeria, relocating, you guys know what I'm talking about, to our city. To come and just stay under the word right in our city. Some of them are buying lands, they are building properties, because they just want to stay where we are, so they can just get this word firsthand. We have a lot of them, they are just moving. So if people are buying tickets and moving their families to come and stay where we are to learn, and then we have come to you with ourselves then you have no excuse i hope you understand you have no excuse not to get what you can get so take advantage of our being here pastor vincent talk with him if you need counseling if you want to be discipled and if you want to be part of bible school from tomorrow he will help you with information at the end of this session all right are you ready for the word 
Let's get in the word. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. And then also those of you who have questions from the things we've been teaching since morning. You can write. It will be easy for somebody to just stand here and read the questions quickly. So I can cover enough than just moving microphones around. So if you have questions, you can write them and transfer them at the end of this teaching. And I will just answer all of them quickly. Can I have a good amen? amen. Who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Now, it's important for you to remember that this morning we began to look at Moses' verbiage. Because we are looking at the development of doctrine. And we said Moses is the father of doctrine. Moses is the one who laid the, 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 the building blocks for all of scriptural doctrine. We looked at heaven and earth. And we said Moses opened Genesis chapter 1 within the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. And then when Moses was saying that, he was not talking about the atmospheric heaven and the earth. He was talking about a spiritual reality. Then he began to say the earth was without form and void. The word tohua bohua in the Hebrew. It means the, word, the earth was nothing, nothing. So there's nothing like pre-Adamic race. The earth was nothing, nothing. But there was darkness. Which means the earth Moses was talking about is not this earth. He was talking about a spiritual reality. Then Moses said, and God said, let there be light. That light is not this light. That light is also a spiritual reality. Then he now brought a metaphor into the discourse to bring out the real communication of what he was saying in verse 1, 2, and 3. He began to talk about the physical heavens, the physical earth, the atmospheric heavens, he began to talk about plants. He began to talk about the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. And on the seventh day, God rested. Now look at that Genesis chapter 2 verse number 1 again. Genesis chapter 2 verse number 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Creation. Now remember, Moses is not giving you um, a, a lecture in science or in creation. He is communicating spiritual realities using the physical just like jesus we use parables physical things to communicate spiritual truth it was the same pattern that moses was using and somebody says why will moses use that because the bible says the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit he cannot receive it so even if you communicate spiritual realities to a natural man you're wasting your time so that is why moses will employ the use of physical things to communicate spiritual realities which the people did not even understand. So now Moses had to move from Sabbath and talk about temple. They still didn't understand. He built a physical structure to get the lesson in. They still didn't understand. He asked them to bring animals. They were bringing animals. They still didn't understand. That's how dull of hearing. That's how backward they were. And that's why a lot of them could not enter the promised land because they were in unbelief. They died in the wilderness. With all that Moses tried to do, they couldn't get it. All right? But when you get born again, you become a man of the spirit. So you can receive spiritual realities. Can I have a good amen? amen. Now, so, those the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them. Look at the next verse now. And on the seventh day, God ended his walk. So on the sixth day, angels were created. And on the sixth day, man was created. Man and angels were created on the same day. Okay? Angels were created to serve man. And God didn't create man until he has finished everything. So on the sixth day, God created man. I believe that man was created in the evening. And I believe that angels were created in the morning. Okay? Angels in the morning, man in the evening. So upon the creation of man, the next thing man will do is sleep. And the next day he wakes up is the day of rest. Because God wanted man to function from a place of rest. From a place of rest. Not from a place of labor or hard work. That was the intent. But observe, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. 
and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made in the morning we saw that when moses instituted the, the sabbath he said on that day they should not do anything they should rest because sabbath is a communication of a rest that christ was bringing it was not about a saturday of joblessness it was a spiritual reality am i communicating at all let me show you matthew chapter 12 verse 1 let jesus speak for himself matthew chapter 12 verse 1 at that time jesus went on the sabbath day on which day hello be with me on which day sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat on sabbath day on sabbath day the disciples with jesus went out and they were walking that's contradictory because the law of Moses say on Sabbath day you shouldn't. In fact, somebody was caught on Sabbath day in numbers trying to get firewood to eat. They cut off his neck. Just firewood to come into his house and eat. They cut off his, they killed him. Now Jesus takes his disciples to go and pluck things on the Sabbath day to eat. Observe, next verse. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. You know what they are trying to say to Jesus? We must enforce the law on them. And what is the law of breaking the Sabbath? You stone. You stone them to death. It's a serious issue we are dealing with here. You wouldn't know because you were not there. But you must sit where they sat to hear what they hear what they heard to understand what was going on here so now they confront jesus and they said it's not lawful to do this on the sabbath day next verse but he said unto them have you not read is the greek word anaginosko that's to say you are reading but you are not paying attention have you not read anaginosko what david did when he was an hungered and they that were with him oh jesus i love jesus man look at the way jesus is going to take them on this journey next verse they were hungry david and his boys were hungry huh how he entered into the house of god and did eat the shoe bread which was not lawful for him to eat neither for them which were with him but only for the priest David and his boys were not priests. They had no right to eat the shoe bread. But they ate and nothing happened. So Jesus said, if you guys did not stone David, you can't stone us. Am I communicating? Now, Jesus is shifting them from Sabbath as a Saturday to what Sabbath was supposed to be. There's a shift. He's moving them from the natural to the spiritual. Are you following here? Now, next verse. Oh, I love Jesus. Or oh, have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Next verse. Oh, boy. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. You know what Jesus is saying? All the temple that Moses made all of you build was pointing to me. I am the message of the temple. So I'm greater than the temple. Then something else Jesus will say now. Oh boy, give me the next verse. But if you had known what this meant, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. What he's saying is all your sacrifices were a waste of economy. They were of no value. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You will not have condemned the guiltless next verse oh everybody read together with me one to go for the son of man is lord even of the sabbath day what jesus is saying is i am the sabbath so the moment jesus entered you you are in the sabbath permanently so every day for you is sabbath you are in the rest of god come on to me all you that labor and are heavy laden i will give you what i will give you rest that rest is the sabbath that moses was talking about in the book of Hebrews, now the writer of Hebrews says, There remained therefore a rest for the people of God. We that have believed have entered. We are not going to enter. 
we have already entered we're in the rest of god we're in the eternal sabbath so the physical sabbath was a communication of a spiritual reality are we together all right so he talked about the sabbath and talked about heaven and earth he talked about temple talked about sacrifices now pay attention to something else a proper study of scripture will be to look from genesis to malachi from genesis to malachi and that is what we call the doctrine of christ studying from genesis to malachi is what we call the doctrine of christ you are able to take on jesus and preach jesus from every book of the bible that's the anchor point of revelation knowledge to be able to preach jesus from every book of the bible is the anchor point of revelation knowledge when paul was saying in first corinthians chapter 2 put it up for me verse 9 first corinthians chapter 2 verse number 9 but as it is written i had not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god had prepared for them whom he loves next verse but god hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit such at all things yea the deep things of god when you get to verse 15 of that first corinthians chapter 2 verse 15 he now said but he that is spiritual judgeth all things yet he himself is judge of no man next verse next verse for who hath known the mind of the lord who has known the mind who knows what god is thinking who knows the thoughts the ideas in god's mind that's Isaiah. This is what Isaiah was saying. Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. Isaiah was asking. Then Paul answered Isaiah. But we. We have the mind of Christ. That means we know what God is thinking in Christ. The mind of Christ is not mind. It's understanding. We have the understanding of Christ. We have the understanding. So the understanding of God is the understanding of Christ. To know God, you have to know Christ. Because Christ is the revelation of God. Christ unveils God. Christ makes God very clear to us. When you see Jesus, you see God. If you do not see Jesus, you cannot see God. And you cannot see Jesus anywhere outside his word. The word of God is the custodian of the revelation of the christ which is the revelation of god can somebody shout hallelujah he says we have the mind of christ so he is the word of god jesus he is the message that's why the gospel is called the gospel of christ the message of christ christ is the message he is what we preach he is what we speak about everything is on him in Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, a lot of scriptures good for your health. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He manifests the Father to us. He said to Philip in John chapter 14 verse 9. John 14 9. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And now says thou then show us the father so jesus is the revelation of the father he that has seen me has seen the father so the anchor point of bible study whether you want to know about god the father or you want to know about the spirit or you want to know about the last days the anchor point of bible study or you you want to even know about the bible itself or about salvation is to study concerning christ that's the anchor point to study concerning Christ from the Old Testament as a promise. From the Old Testament as a promise. In the four Gospels as the Word became flesh. In the four Gospels as the Word became flesh. In the epistles as the promise fulfilled. Genesis to Malachi, the promise. In the four Gospels, the word became flesh in the epistles the promise fulfilled 
you will see it in Genesis in gem form in a seed you will see it as a type and shadow in the law of Moses you will see it in David's song my God my God why has thou forsaken me you will see it written when he said they have moved against the Lord and is anointed talking about Jesus so you will see that the anchor point is Jesus as a shadow in the law in the songs of David and in the prophet also as a prophecy hallelujah so you do a study of the Bible and the study of the Bible is Christology Christology that's the accurate complete study of the Bible where you can know God the Father in Christ to know God the Father in Christ not in a vision not in a dream not in how I feel but in the person of Christ are we teaching here that's how to know God to know God the Father in Christ so Christ unveils the Father to us you understand the spirit pneumatology in Christ you understand eschatology the last day events in Christ the Bible itself in Christ so it's from that point that we can look at God we can look at God Jesus said he that has seen me has seen the father so if you're going to know God you will know God in Christ Jesus you will have to know him as a father in Christ Jesus that's the best form and most approved form of studying you know sometimes I come across theologians theologians who went to seminaries and Bible schools I come across them and they say to me Dr. Damina there's something about your teaching I went to seminary I went to Bible school I graduated I was taught all these courses but it didn't mean anything to me but when I began to listen to you all the pieces of puzzles fo started falling in place now all the things they taught me is making meaning I said yes because once you leave the Christocentricity of scripture you will go off tangent every study you will study without Christ as the center point you are a joke theology without Christ is nonsense if you like be a professor of theology without Christ you are a waste total waste of time is Christ that is the theology of the Bible you didn't hear that ask any theologian Christ is the theology of the Bible because the Bible is a theology and the theology of the Bible is Christology if you can't see Jesus you're you're not reading the Bible you're just reading newspaper until you read and see Christ everywhere you have not read and teaching good yeah you have not read because the whole intent is to reveal, reveal Christ in Christ you find salvation and the mission of God is to save but he cannot save you outside Christ he can only save you in Christ and listen you don't have to be a nice guy to be saved you just have to believe in what Christ has done to be saved it's as easy as that but how can you believe what you have not heard how can you believe on whom you have not heard and how can you hear without a preacher and how can the preacher preach except he be sent this is so important this is so 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 important you will have to know Christ as the father that's the best form and most approved form of study when the Bible says rightly dividing the word of truth he's talking about preaching and teaching the Bible in the light of Christ like we often say Christ is the revelation of all things Christ is the revelation of all things when you're able to understand Jesus Christ in the Bible and to understand the Christocentric nature of the Bible then the Bible becomes clear to you the Bible becomes clear to you in the first service this morning we said Moses employed the use of the word heaven metaphorically to describe where God carries out his activities it carries with it the understanding of spiritual activities when it is used in reference to God 
You know, many people think that uh, heaven is a planet somewhere where we're going to travel to. That is because you've not been taught well. Heaven is not a planet somewhere. Heaven is not a planet in outer space. No. Heaven is a spiritual reality. Is a realm. Are we teaching? Is a realm. Is a reality. That's why Jesus will say, I am the son of man and I am in heaven. He's on earth. He's on earth. He's among us. And he says, even now, I am in heaven. That's not a planet. John 3.13. No man had ascended up to heaven. Put it up for me. John 3.13. And no man had ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is, so even while he was walking here and talking to us, he was in heaven. Teaching good? Heaven is not a planet. Heaven is a spiritual reality. That's why right now you are in heaven. It's not heaven at last. Heaven at last, he says, come. Is heaven at first. And some pastors like to use heaven at last to control. To just control you and put fear in you. So they can manipulate you by telling you, I hope you will make it. The way you are behaving, I don't think you will make it. So you become scared. They give you one week fasting, you fast. You understand? Just to manipulate you. But the truth of the gospel should set you free. The truth of the gospel should set you free. So you can enjoy serving God. Somebody shout, I hear you. Say with me, I made heaven the day I received Christ. Say no, no seven keys to heaven. No 15 steps to heaven. I'm in heaven. And I didn't keep any steps. I only received Christ. Automatically. I'm in heaven right now. Glory to God. God has planted eternity in our hearts. Hallelujah. This is good, right? Now let's look at the use of the word earth. Heaven and earth. We're looking at Moses' verbiage. If you're not here in the morning service, get the material. It will help you a lot. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Observe the narrative of the use of the word earth in creation. It was used to describe creatures that were created by God. The earth was used to describe creatures that were created by God. In Genesis 1, 10 to 25, you can write it for further study at home. Genesis 1, 10 to 25. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. So the word earth means a communication to describe creatures as created by God. Then there is the dominion of the earth as seen in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Put it up for me. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And over the fowl of the air. And over the cattle. And over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Next verse. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he male and female created he them. Next verse. And God blessed them. And God said unto them. Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea. And over the fowl of the air. And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That will imply that the activities in the earth will be a function of man. The activities in the earth will be a function of man. Look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 5. Genesis chapter 2 verse number 5. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. The reason for the earth is man. Please write that down. The reason for the earth is man. And the reason for man is God. The reason for the earth is man. The reason for man 
is God. God needs man to live in. Man needs the earth to dwell in. So the earth is a place for man's activities. The earth was created for man to inhabit. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1. Genesis 6 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. And daughters were born unto them. Next verse. We're going to read to verse 6. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that were, that were fair. And they took them wives of all there, of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Next verse. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Next verse. Pay attention. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. So the earth is a place for man's activities. That's the point I'm making. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was continually only evil. Or only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. Next verse. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. Please pay attention. So Moses describes the earth as a place where man dwells and where man carries out his activities. In Genesis chapter 11 verse 1, Genesis 11 verse 1, we are still looking at Moses' verbiage. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. The term whole earth referred to man. The whole earth. He was referring to man. So the earth is descriptive of man's primary place of activity. The earth is man's primary place of activity. Look at Psalm 115 verse 16. Psalms 115 verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth had he given to the children of men. Ecclesiastes 5.2 going to do a few reading ecclesiastes 5 2 because that's how we teach bible be not rash with thy mouth and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before god for god is in heaven and thou upon earth therefore let thy words be few the earth is a place for man's activities first kings 8 43 first kings 8 43 and 44 hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger call it to thee for. That all people of the earth may know thy name. To fear thee as do thy people Israel. And that they may know that this house which I have built is called by thy name. Next verse. If thy people go out to battle against their enemy. Whithersoever thou shalt send them. And shall pray unto the Lord toward the city which thou hast chosen. And toward the house that I have built for thy name. So the earth is a place for man's activities. Job chapter 7 verse 1 and 2. Job chapter 7 verse 1 and 2. Is there not an appointed time to man upon earth? And not his days also like the days of an hireling? Verse 2. As a servant earnestly desired the shadow, and as an hireling looketh for the reward of his work. So the earth is a place for man's primary activities. Job 24 and 5. Job chapter 20 verse 4 and 5. Knowest thou not this of old? Since man was placed upon the earth, next verse, that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. Psalm 33 verse 8. Psalm 33 verse 8. We're establishing that the earth is a place for man's primary operation. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Isaiah 45, 11 to 13. Isaiah 45, 11 to 13. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the works of my hands. Command ye me. Next verse. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. Next verse. I have raised him up in righteousness 
and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and he shall let go my captives. Not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. So the earth was created for man to dwell in. This earth is not a domain for evil spirits. The earth was created for man. So evil spirits are illegal on the earth. So that's why as a believer, you have the authority to cast them out. And they will obey you without effort. Casting out devils is not supposed to be a service. You know all those churches where they spend the whole Sunday doing casting out of devils? Satan has taken over the church. It's not supposed to be a service. Because that's a distraction to the teaching of God's word, which is the primary mission of the church. And the devil knows that those pastors are as stupid as him. So he engages them in wasting people's time. How many of you there? How many? Come out, come out. Fire, 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 fire. How many? 300. Fire, fire, fire. I'm sorry, we're 100. Fire, fire. I'm sorry, we're 1,000. Then they fall down, they break chairs, scatter the whole place. And then you that don't know the scripture will say that is power. No, that is not power. That is distraction. That's not power. When you have power, you speak quietly and the demons exit quietly because they don't want to get in your way. That's real power. Jesus will say, out. Like we were saying before. Teaching continues. Not that all of us now gather to be watching two, three people on the pulpit. All right, everybody shall start shouting fire, 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 fire. The whole church. Ah, ah. It's lack of teaching. It's lack of teaching. It is the word of God that is power. Where the word of a king is. That's the power. As I'm teaching you right now, there's no drama here. But you're getting empowered inside. When you walk out of here, you're on top. When you need a miracle, you don't have to look for me. You know that you are the miracle carrier. You command it and you see it come to pass. Here, we are not giving you fish to eat. We are teaching you to fish. That's what Bible teaching does. It equips and empowers. Am I communicating? Or oh, sometimes... Uh, I see those kind of signs and I just get disgusted. And I'm like, hey guys, what's up with you? Can't you think? Can't you think? A demon you're spending three hours to cast is either you are stupid or the demon is stupid. <laughs> Why three hours? It should be seconds. Out is out. Yes. Huh? Out? out? Exactly. And once I command the demon out, that demon shouldn't come in again. So the next service, the same person shouldn't be the one again we're shouting out from. I hope you know it's the same people most times that keep recycling it. It means all of them are stupid. It's not an insult, it's a description. People pay their transport, suspended their activities to come and sit down and be watching drama. You have a TV in your house, don't you? There are movies. You can watch better movies at home. Then come and watch people vomiting and rolling on the floor like snakes. And you know, some of them, when they discover that people are really looking, they, make, they do the drama well. So that the entertainment is worth it. At the expense of your spiritual growth. The mission of the church is to teach and equip believers to grow. The church is a Bible school. I hope you know that. That's why you hear me. I'm dealing with all theology, Christology. Because church is Bible school. If pastors do their work well, there will be no need for Bible school. 
Bible school is an indictment on pastors. Since you don't want to do your work, let's create a school where we can take some of your members and do what you are supposed to do that you didn't do. That's why Bible schools were created. I'm serious. Because churches were not doing their jobs. Every time you come to church, you should be ready to learn because you're coming to school. And after a while, you two are a minister. The whole essence is to, to make all of you preachers of the gospel. Am I communicating? Preachers of the gospel. Who reveal Christ, teach Christ, make Christ known. Praise God. It's not about heroism. God wants all of us to grow and be a blessing to our world. Praise God. And in Kenya, you guys will manifest big time. Your amen is looking for some help. Yeah. Say with me, I am the light of the world. I am, the light of the world. I am growing in knowledge. I am growing, I am growing in grace. Growing. My light will shine. Yeah. Men will see it. Yeah. And they will come to my God. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Yeah. Praise God. So the earth was created for man to dwell in. While heaven relates to an unseen reality. An unseen reality that is identified with God. Heaven is an unseen reality that is identified with God. The earth is for man, physical. The heaven is an unseen reality. It's a reality. It's a reality. It's just that it's a reality that is not seen with the physical eyes. And that heaven is not far. It's right here. You are not traveling to heaven. You are already in heaven now. Am I teaching? Right now you are in heaven and you are on earth at the same time. You are a dual citizen. You are a dual citizen. You have two passports. Kenyan passport and heaven's passport. What Kenyan passport cannot do, you suspend Kenya and bring heaven's passport. It's called miracles. I'm teaching good. You're a dual citizen. You can operate two worlds. You have the best of the two worlds. Teaching good. Heaven is also seen as the sphere of God's authority. With and for man in the earth. Heaven is God's control room in the earth. God's control room. The sphere of God's authority on the earth. Therefore, heaven and earth is a description of a union. Heaven and earth. It's a description of a union. And it was written figuratively for God and man. So Moses' communication of heaven and earth was a communication of a union between God and man. And this shows the plan and purpose of God from the beginning. That's been the plan from the beginning of time. Hallelujah. Write down these scriptures. You can read them at home. Genesis 24.3. Genesis 24.3. Genesis 24, 7. Joshua 2, 11. Give me 1 Kings 8, 27 on the screen. 1 Kings 8, 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens. Boy, these guys had verbiage. Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built it. So David knew that God was not in that temple. God never, how will God live in a house? What's the size of that house? Are we teaching? David himself said, the heaven, heaven, 
heaven. Even if there are triple heavens, cannot contain you. How much less a small house? I love these patriarchs, man. They had an insight. You know they were prophets, so they foresaw. Second Kings five fifteen. Second Kings five fifteen. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Write down this, Second Chronicles 6.14. Then give me Second Chronicles 6.18. Second Chronicles 6.18. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built? Ezra 1 2, you can read that at home. Ezra 5 11 to 12, you can read that at home. Give me Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Glory to God. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house? Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? God is asking for a place where he will rest. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And they use gold and diamonds to build a house. The house is standing and God is asking them, where is the house? Because that thing you built there is not the house. I refuse to recognize it. When he was asking for the house in Isaiah 66, the temple of Solomon was standing. You know what I'm talking about? The temple of Moses was standing and God was still asking for the house because the house was not a physical building. The house was going to be a house of his resurrection. And today I have news for you. You are that house. You are the place of God's rest. So God is resting in you. Are we in the building? God is resting inside you. Jeremiah 23, 24, and 25. Jeremiah 23, 24 to 25. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Save the Lord. Do not I feel heaven and earth? Save the Lord. Next verse. I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed. I have dreamed. You say they are lying. God said, I feel the heavens and I feel the earth. So that phrase, heaven and earth, in Genesis 1 1, was to describe the union of God and man. It is the expression of the activity of God in the earth through man. So God will be seen, God will be evident in the earth through man. God will be seen and known in the earth through man. Immortality with mortality. The gospel of life and immortality. That's what we preach. You have passed from death to life. You die no more. You die no more. Now some people who do not understand the concept of life and immortality will tell you that they cannot die physically. That's not true. That's not what life and immortality means. Life and immortality means you live forever. And in order for you to live forever, this body will have to be changed. 
Either it will be changed by death or it will be changed by resurrection. But one way or the other, this body must be changed. Because this body is mortal and it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So when people die, where do they go? They go nowhere. They go nowhere. Now that you're on earth, you're a child of God, where are you? No, where are you? In heaven? In where? In Christ. Where are you? In Christ. Where are you? Where are you? In Christ. Where are you? In Christ. If any man be, so where are you? If a man in Christ dies, where is he? So there's no travel. The only difference is that you dropped this body. But you are still where you are. It's just that physical people can't see you again. But you are still where you are. There's no distance. You didn't go anywhere. You only dropped this body to continue where you are. In Christ. I don't know if I'm teaching here. The only person that doesn't have where to go is a man without Christ. Where do they go when they die without Christ? They go into darkness. Outer darkness. Awaiting judgment. Because the moment you hear the gospel and you reject the gospel, you are judged. You know, some of you think that when, when life is over and we all appear, then God will sit down on a throne and people will line up, God will be judging them. Who has time for that kind of work? You think God is jobless? God is not jobless. Right here on earth, as the gospel is preached, judgment is happening. If you believe, you're saved. If you don't believe, you're condemned. And if you die condemned, it's hell. If you die saved, you're in heaven where you have been. You're not going to be in a line. The preaching of the gospel is judgment. He that believes is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned. Judgment has already happened. So when a man dies without Christ, we cry. Because we'll never see him again. It's over forever. That's why we cry. It is the cry of departure. Final cry. We miss you eternally. It's a very serious matter. When people die in Christ, we celebrate. Because there will be a reunion. Glory. There will be a reunion. And we shall assemble together and celebrate forever. That's why we must preach. We must preach. So that the devil doesn't take the people we love to hell. We preach to our families. We preach to our friends. We preach the gospel to people who don't know Christ. So that we can save as many as we can save. Say I hear you. We don't play with it. It's a very serious issue. And every time you stand before people to preach. Know that you are, you are deciding their eternity. So it's not a time to smile. Because you're dealing with eternal matters. Preaching the gospel is a serious responsibility. Yes, judgment is taking place. Because if people reject the good news, they are judged. If people accept the good news, they are judged righteously. See? So important. Praise God. So, Moses teaching Israel this, built a place for worship. And Moses, the only way he could explain to them the union between God and man was sanctuary. Sanctuary, which is the union of God and man. Notice Moses' choice of words. God said, let us make man in our image. And some people have asked me, but God said, let us. Who was he talking to? Let us. Let us make man. 
So who was God consulting? Have you ever wondered? Let us. He didn't say, I will make man in my image. He said, let us. Well, again, I've told you that Bible words are not English language. That word, let us, in the Hebrew, speaks of plan or intent. That's the meaning of let us. That is, my plan and my intent is to make man in our image. It's not like he was consulting somebody. It's the ancient way of communication in the Hebrew. The word image was translated from the Hebrew word selem, T-S-E-L-E-M, which implies likeness or representation. So Moses points us to one who was described as the image of God. Hmm. Moses is pointing us to one who is described as the image of God. Let us make man. What is God saying in letting us make man? What is the intent? The intent of God is that he referred to the exact representation of God and the one through whom God's intent and plan will be fulfilled in the earth. That man that will be created will be the vehicle of fulfilling God's plan and intent in the earth. That man in Genesis. And that is the man that they kept inquiring about. What is man that thou art mindful of? What is man? Man. Because Genesis 1 says, let us make man. So what is this man? It's not Adam. The Genesis 1.26 man is not Adam. Hebrews 2.6. The New Testament explains the Old Testament. But one in a certain place testified saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Next verse. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and this set him over the works of thy hands. Next verse. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Let them have dominion over all. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But when we look at Adam, we don't see everything under him. So the man he's talking about is not Adam. Because, go back, go back to verse 8. But now we see not yet all things put under Adam. So it can be Adam that Genesis 1.26 is talking about. So then we look again, next verse. But we see Jesus. That's the Genesis man. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. So now he becomes the one bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. We do not see all things put under Adam. Then we looked very well and we saw that it is Jesus that all things are under him. And he brought on all things under him by death. In dying, he obtained the authority. Am I communicating at all? How many of you remember that in the temptation of Jesus, uh, Satan told Jesus to worship him? He will give him the kingdoms of this world and the glories. You remember that? You know what Satan was telling Jesus? If you worship me, you don't have to die. 
if you worship me you don't have to die i will give you the humans that you're looking for jesus said look at you look at you have you not read that i am the lord your god have you not read because satan has a bible oh yes he has a bible a very big one the type you used to call family bible Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. You serve only me. If it's a heart of men, I don't have to worship you to get it. I know how to get it. That's why I came. When I die, I will finish you. And I will recover man to myself. So Jesus didn't bow to temptation. He went through the process of death, paid the price. And today he has you in his hands. He pushed Satan out of your heart and took over your heart. And today Jesus is the Lord of your heart. Without having to worship Satan. Are we teaching good? Glory to God. And today when you come into Christ. You are also in dominion. So let, let, let them have dominion over things. Not over people. We don't have authority over people. We have authority over things. So stop looking for how to force people in your prayer. That's witchcraft. Afternoon witchcraft. God never designed for people to rule people. God designed for people to rule things. Is it clear? Yes. God made all of us free moral agents to make our choices and live by it. But we can rule over circumstances, over situations, over sickness, over disease. We rule over demons and devils. We rule over circumstances and situations of life. We take authority, we exercise authority. But we do not have authority over people. But we can pray and arrange circumstances that will move people to do what we want we can supplicate circumstances that will rearrange things and situate people where they will do what we want did you understand what i said but we don't force people but we can speak to circumstances in supplication and those circumstances will be arranged in a way that People will find themselves in a situation where they just have to do something for you. And this week it will happen for you. Amen. That amen is not good enough. Amen. People will be arranged for you. Circumstances will be arranged for you. Amen. Favors will be arranged for you. Amen. Solutions will be arranged for you. Answers will be arranged for you. Amen. Throughout this week, your week will be exceptional. Amen. You will walk in the light. You will walk in miracles. You will walk in testimonies. Amen. Things that were difficult and impossible for you will become very easy this week. What cannot defeat God cannot defeat you. What cannot deny God cannot deny you. Those of you that are at a place where you are like at a crossroad, you don't know what to do, receive direction. And those of you that things have been very rough and very tough for you, I command every situation to bow in the name of Jesus. Receive a miracle right now. The favor of God is working in your direction. You have supernatural direction and clarity of thoughts. I command the realities of heaven on your inside to manifest on your outside. In the name of Jesus. We are doors. We are locked. We command the doors to open. He opened it and no man shut it. He shut it and no man opened it. He has set before you an open door. No man can shut that door. So walk into that door in the name of Jesus. Bayo de Geska, Male Garota, Sekele Nema, Le Grondo Jeka, Ninga, Nongo, Luda, Baba, Rege, Dega, Gaga, Sotoni, Geges. Ibolo do Boze, Kelene, Mamos. Those of you believing for fruit of the womb, receive that miracle now. In the name of Jesus. Businesses and jobs, I command them to flourish. Receive ideas, receive concepts, receive insights. I command a floodgate of new relationships release into your life. There are some of you here, you've been hanging around, around the wrong people. 
you've been hanging around the wrong people. They are not adding no value to you. Rather, they are taking even the little value that you have. You have to change your company and you know you're the one I'm talking to right now. You have to change your company. You have to change your company. You are the one I'm talking to and you know. In your heart, you know you're the one. Because they're going to hinder you from walking in the light and walking in the purpose that God has for you. When they were going, the wise men, the wise men, they were going to worship Jesus. The star led them. They followed the star from the east. But then they entered the house of Herod and the star disappeared. The star disappeared. Only when they came out of Herod's house, the star reappeared. There are people you don't let into your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Relationships that will bring value to you, I release them right now. I'm not hearing your amen. And I decree and declare that this revelation of what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. Can we all read together? Everybody stand with me because I want to pray for you. We're through. We're through with the service. And then I'll answer a few questions before we go. Can we all read together everybody? You want to go. But God. For his great love. We're with. Somebody say he already loves me. It's too late for God. To change his mind. Did you see loved? For his great love. We're with he. He's already loved you. Even when you were naughty and being funny, he just loves you. Somebody say, God just loves me. I'm not here. He say, God just loves me. All right, next verse, verse 5. Oh, glory to God. Let's go. Even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us by grace. Now, now that he has quickened you, you're born again. Look at the next verse. Everybody want to go. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenlies in Christ Jesus. So where are you sitting right now? In heavenlies. Where is heavenlies? In Christ. That's where you're sitting right now. You are in Kenya at the same time you are in heaven. Amen. Amen. Say with me, I'm a heavenly citizen. Say, it was God's plan. From the beginning of time. It has materialized in my life. Amen. 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 Glory. Hallelujah. Are you blessed? You are right hand up. Father, we pray for everybody under the sound of my voice. That you grow in grace and in knowledge and abound in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Every need of yours is met. Revelation knowledge grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. Great grace is upon you. I decree that you continue to enjoy all of the robust supplies of God. Your steps are ordered. Your thoughts are ordered. And in the name of Jesus, you know what to do and where to do it. You have direction and clarity of thoughts. Great grace is upon you. In Jesus' name we pray. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Well, give Jesus the greatest shout. Hallelujah. Whoa.
you can be seated with your sweet smart self this afternoon now before we answer the questions let's take our offerings so that we get that out of the way grab your offerings let's give in faith and listen you need to support this conference because it's costing a lot of money for us to be with you in kenya for two weeks it's costing a lot so you need to support us so that you know the burden is not just on a few people let's all give generously you know let's all give generously let's all give joyfully and let's all give sacrificially it's important very important you know um it's important so that all the bills of the conference all the bills that you know are you know we're having it on daily basis are all taken care of you know i know you are wonderful people you will make sure that our bills are paid right i know you are so let's do it let's do it let's do it let's give willingly let's give joyfully you can make the transfers the account is on the screen and uh, if you have your own cash you can also bring it to the platform there are baskets and there are other baskets around you can just drop your offerings in them and i want you to know we we honor you we love you and we thank you for giving and thank you for supporting what we do and together we'll get this gospel all over this nation and all over eastern africa i didn't hear your amen. amen praise god you have to do me the favor of inviting everybody you can reach for next week is that is that a deal hello hello is that a deal you have to get everybody you can get in town ask them to plan from today start inviting them they should plan their schedule so that next saturday and sunday they are free to be in the conference the more people we get this gospel to the better so let's get out let's get busy let's get the work done somebody says but this hall is already full where will you keep people don't worry leave that to us just bring the people we know how to keep them if we have to command a miracle for the hall to expand we will command a miracle for the hall to expand but you just bring the people for us praise god all right so if you have your offerings you can drop them you know just before we go into the question and answers offerings offerings and at the end of the service i'll hang around to autograph books for those who bought books who wants me to autograph i will do that just before we leave the building at the end of this service okay thank you thank you for giving thank you for giving thank you for giving thank you for giving thank you for supporting what we do in east africa and around the world thank you thank you for giving thank you for giving thank you for giving hallelujah thank you for giving hallelujah thank you for giving thank you for giving thank you lord jesus praise you father thank you for giving hallelujah all right let's do it I'm ready for questions thank you papa for the revelation um the first question is what was the meaning of the three hour period of darkness when christ died Three hour of darkness was just three hour of darkness. <laughs> Finish. Three hour of darkness was three hour of darkness. Next question. <laughs> the next question is We're silent where the Bible is silent. We're loud where the Bible is loud. He just told us there was three hour of darkness. That's all. And uh, no explanation. The next question on 1 Corinthians 11:23 concerning the holy communion please expound. Wow. That's going to be a whole hour of exegesis. So since I won't have the time to do that there's a book called the communion table. It's right at the book stand the communion table. And what I did was to deal with the communion from the beginning to the end of the Bible from the through the whole scriptures. But you'll all agree with me, if you're a good Bible student here, that there's no word in the Bible called Holy Communion. None. So it's not even in the Bible. I don't even know why they're practicing it. That word, Holy Communion, is not in the Bible. The only word you find in the Bible that looks like that Holy Communion is Passover. The Passover was a feast of the Jews instituted by Moses in Exodus that spoke of Christ's redemption. So it was still Moses' verbiage. And then today, Christians have taken that and made it eating and drinking. 
communion service. We have been taking communion in this place from the time I started teaching. As I was teaching in this service, you were eating the body and drinking the blood. Today, the body and the blood is not physical. It's his word. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Is that clear? That's just a teaser. But that book will fix it up for you. Communion table. Next question. The next question. What does one have to do to break a curse or evil altars in his life or family? First of all, there's nothing like evil altars if you're born again. If you're born again and you still have evil altars, something is wrong with your born again. Because the day you got born again, you move from darkness to light. The day you got born again, you became a new creation in Christ. So you don't have any altar. What is an altar, first of all? An altar is a place of animal sacrifice. That's the meaning of altar. Place of animal sacrifice. That is what was practiced in the Old Testament before Jesus came. They were bringing animal sacrifices to offer at the altar. Jesus has come as the last animal and he has died. So no more altars. That's why no apostle taught on altars. And Christianity is built on the foundation of the apostle and prophets. Jesus himself, the cornerstone. So what the apostles didn't do, we are not permitted to do it. No apostle to preach causes, no apostle to preach generational causes, family patterns, no apostle preached it. Because you can't be in Christ and be talking of family patterns and generational curses. There's no more cause for the believer. Did you hear that? No cause. No cause. And no altar. You are a free man in Christ. And you are living in a realm of liberty. Where you enjoy the goodness of God. No fear. You are in authority. Praise God. Maybe next Saturday I should deal with curses. I should just have an overview of the whole thing. Curses in the Bible. So I can help some of you. So that your mind is totally free from those things. Because some of you I'm sure they have drummed the thing into your subconscious. 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 And we need to drill it out. And put the blessing. Praise God. So nothing like curses, nothing like altars. You're free. And you know the reason why those messages make sense to you is because they use it to describe your circumstances. That's why it makes sense. So when things are not working, it's a curse. When you're struggling, it's from the altar. All that is nonsense. The reason why things are not working is because you're a human being. There are things that are common to men. The reason why things are tough is because you are a human being and you live in a society that is not even. Some governments will come and it, they will favor you and some other governments will come, they won't favor you. It's part of humanity anyway. Is it not true? Kenya is getting ready for elections, right? Yes, another government will come and they'll come with their policies. They may favor you and they may not. It's part of life. Don't be interpreting things that happen, trying to give them spiritual connotation. You hit your leg, it must be a demon. Then you are having a psycho, a psycho, psychotic situation. If you hit your leg, you hit your leg. Eh, that's all. And if you wound it, put medication on it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. At least there's a solution. I'm teaching good. Don't let. Don't let people mess around with you. You are in Christ. Be happy in Christ. Next question. How do you explain to someone about the man Uzziah who died when he tried to catch the ark of the covenant when it fell? It was the law of sin and death. All of them were under the law. And under the law of Moses, the law of sin and death was tormenting them. That's why in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and and death. So what was killing them cannot kill you because you are free from that law. Is it clear? Next question. Difference between son of God and son of man. Son of God, deity, son of man, humanity, all in Christ. Next. When Jesus was baptized uh, by the Holy Spirit, 
uh, when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. Does it mean the Holy Spirit is different from Jesus? Well, again, yeah, in redemptive, in redemption, the Trinity is a concept of redemption. The Trinity is a concept of redemption. Let me repeat. The Trinity is a concept of redemption. There is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. There are no two gods. There is one. But because of the fall of man, in order for God to save man, if God came to the earth as God, nobody can kill God. If you kill God, then he's no more God. But God loves man. And God must do something about man's state because he loves man. So God became a man. If he is God, he should become whatever he wants to become. So God became a man, Christ, died as a man, buried, rose, and saved you. But upon his resurrection, a man cannot live inside a man. Because the reason for his death is to live in you. So he came into you as the Holy Spirit. It's the same person. But for the purpose of redemption, he changes form and shape to serve the purpose of saving man. That's the depth of God's love. Is it clear? It's not three people. It's just one person with functions that brings man into his ultimate purpose. Next question. I have a teaching on it for those who really want to get details on the Trinity concept. It's called Reflecting the Father. Reflecting the Father. I think it's part one to six. It's about six hours. Reflecting the Father. If you order for it from our office, you get the full teaching on God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Full details. Yes, next question. Next question I'll, I'll combine two of them. Okay. How do I ruthlessly discipline my body to stop sinning, especially the sin of sexual immorality? The other one is, when one commits suicide, is he, she condemned? Um, does a Christian have the right to undertake cremation instead of conducting burial rites? How does one overcome suicidal thoughts? Well, um, let's begin from sexual immorality. How do you be overcome sexual immorality? By making yourself accountable. So if you find out you're always falling into sex, you're always drawn into sexual immorality, look for a matured believer whom you can trust and tell him, I'm struggling with a weakness. I need help. So now he's going to hold you accountable. That's the first thing. So every time that desire starts coming, you give him a call. That desire has started coming. You remember yesterday I told you, a change of facts will kill the appetite for sex. Oh, you don't know? If you're about to sleep with a woman and she gives you a clean slap, will you still have the desire? You will get angry and tell her nonsense, get out. <laughs> so you're not helpless. That's the point I'm making. Yeah. When it comes to sexual sin, you're not helpless. You're not a victim. Yeah. Stop seeing yourself a victim. Just get an accountability system. Somebody who holds you accountable, somebody who talks to you, somebody who acts, who is inquiring about you. And somebody you can open up to all the time. Brother Paul says, if a man be overtaken in sin, ye that are spiritual, restore. That's accountability system. Then the second thing is, spend more time feeding on the word of God. You know, get our teachings on the message of Christ. Not just any word of God. The message of Christ. Because there are many word of God that are not word of God. The message of Christ. Because we all with open face, as we behold the glory of God as in a mirror, as we keep beholding, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory. So as you keep looking at Jesus, a transformation takes place in your life. Those appetites will die without you knowing when. But your focus must be right. Then number two, accountability system. All right. Second question, suicide. If you commit suicide, do you go to heaven? Yes. 
you go to heaven if you commit suicide. All of us here are committing suicide. <laughs> but very gradual. We are all committing gradual suicide. The doctor told you sugar is not good for you, but you cannot do without sugar. Every day you finish five bottles of Coca-Cola. What is that? Gradual suicide. Every death is a kind of suicide. Because it generates into sickness. And what brought the sickness is lifestyle. Who made the choices for the lifestyle? You. It's just that some people make it fast. Bam! They take away their life fast. And others take it gently. <laughs> is it clear? And I can give you a scripture to establish that. Samson, Samson killed himself and killed other people. And the book of Hebrews tells us, Samson is an elder who through faith obtained a good report. So Samson is in heaven even after committing suicide and murder without having time to repent. Is it clear? Yes, Most times what moves people into suicide is depression. Yes. Now what brings depression is lack of the word. When you're not hearing the word of God, you do not have joy. The word of God gives you joy that the world cannot give. Yes. That's why the more you listen to the word, the more you overcome the sorrows of this earth. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying. You've got to spend time. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate there in day and night. I give you joy which the world cannot give. You know, in the world you shall have tribulation, but in me you shall have joy. Yes, so stay more in the world. You'll be free from suicidal thoughts. Yes. If you stay more in the world, you will discover a purpose for life. Yes. You will discover a reason to live. Yes. You will discover a reason to be happy in life. Am I communicating? Yes, Somebody said to me, Dr. Damina, why are you always happy? You're always smiling. I've never seen you frown. The word of God that is bubbling inside me, eh? Is too much. There's no place for sadness and depression. There's too much fire inside my system. Because every part of me is scripture coming. As some quiet scriptures are just running through my system. I'm full of joy. And I can tell you, if you give yourself to the word of God, you will be so full of joy that you will not think of suicide. And if you have suicidal thoughts, one of the other ways to deal with it is get a matured brother or sister to hold you accountable and walk you through being free from those thoughts. The world will say, get a counselor, right? Get a counselor, an expert to deal with you and help you out. But sometimes even those counselors get frustrated because they don't even know how to handle you. But a brother that is matured in Christ will help you because he will use both spiritual and, uh, you know, physical wisdom to walk you through suicide and get you out of it. I have a lot of people who have reached out to me and say they were almost at the verge of committing suicide and then they stumbled on my teaching and now they have a reason to live. Quite a lot of testimonies. So get the word. Then finally, cremation or burial. Choice is yours. <laughs> Tell your children how you want it. Tell them when I die, just pour fuel on my body and set it on fire. Gather the ashes. They'll do it. Nothing will stop resurrection. <laughs> Even if they take your ashes and spread them all over the world. P drop some in America. Drop some in Australia. Drop some in Africa. Drop some in India. On the resurrection day, the moment the trumpet sounds, all of it will come fit together and you shall be changed. Just like the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37. Bone to bone. There was a shaking. And... Glory to God. Next question. About divorce, should a person marry again, yet he or she has already divorced? Well, what is marriage? Marriage is cultural. Marriage is cultural. There's no Christian marriage. Marriage is cultural. Because if you say there's Christian marriage, what about unbelievers' marriage? Is it not marriage? It's marriage. Evil people's marriage, is it not marriage? It's marriage. So marriage is marriage. Because marriage is cultural. That's why you don't just carry a woman on the road and say, let's go. No, you have to go and see her father. And her father will have to consult his family. Then they will decide what to require from you. They will give you a list. Then you will now supply everything they demand. Then they will set a day to hand the lady over to you. And there are cultures where it is the lady that will supply. And then they will decide the day to hand over the man to the lady. 
different cultures. Am I communicating? In Nigeria, there are some tribes where you marry, you, you, you visit the family three times before you marry. The first one, they call it knocking the door. You don't come empty. You come with responsibility. Then you now come the second time where they now give you a list. Then you now come the third time to supply what they gave you before they now hand over the lady to you. Now, once that lady is handed over to you by her parents, you are married, whether you come to church or not. Because marriage is cultural. So there's no Christian marriage, but there are Christians in marriage. So what the Bible teaches us is how to live as Christians in marriage. Is it clear? So if marriage is cultural and circumstances as it is with human institutions became so tough that a husband and wife who is a pastor couldn't live together, maybe due to domestic abuse, emotional, psychological abuse or something, and they decided to divorce. And the families came together and returned the dowry and everything. That marriage never existed. That marriage never existed because the law of that marriage has been dissolved. So that man is free to marry and that lady is free to marry. See, it's the way marriage has been taught in the body of Christ that is causing all the problem. They didn't teach it well doctrinally. They taught it with sentiments, human sentiments, not pure doctrine. And what I'm giving you here is sound doctrine. I can take you from scripture to scripture and explain that to you. As long as a woman is bound by the law of her husband, she is loyal to that husband. But when the law is dissolved, that woman is free. That's what the Bible teaches. And the man is also free. Now, the man is free to get remarried. Or the woman is free to get remarried. Let me ask all of you a question. Let's just think as human beings. Just a simple moral question. So which will you prefer? The pastor is divorced. The marriage is dissolved. Him pick another woman and marry or sleep around with 50, 60 sisters. Which do you prefer? Exactly. Exactly. Because a man is still a man. His blood is still hot. He has not died. I'm teaching good. So instead of sleeping around, pregnant four or five sisters at the same time, just pick one woman, marry and be controlled and serve the purpose of God. Have I answered your question? Next question. When the word says God lives in the believer, how does that happen? Which part of the body does God reside in? The spirit. The spirit of the believer. Your spirit is bigger than this room. Your spirit is bigger than this room. Let me tell you. You can develop your spirit where your spirit will be bigger than the whole of Kenya. Your spirit has no limit. That's why it's immaterial. It's invisible. And that's the real man inside. This body is the container of the real man. Your spirit is big. And that is where God stays. In the spirit of the believer. So when God lives inside your spirit... Then we renew your mind so that your mind and your spirit can work in, in agreement. Then your body will carry out the decision of your spirit and your mind. You walk in the spirit. Is it clear? Yes. Next question. At what point does forgiveness of sin happen? Is it at the point of belief or one has to confess their sins physically? No, forgiveness of sin happened when Jesus died. <laughs> the moment Jesus died, all sins are forgiven. But it is not automatic. So Jesus' death has forgiven man of his sin. But it is activated in your life when you receive the gospel. Is it clear? Yes, because Jesus is not going to die again. So that one death has forgiven mankind. But a man will have to accept it for it to be activated in his life. We know that believers are righteous. Does righteousness mean sinlessness? So why does John in his epistle say that we lie to ourselves if we, if we say we have no sin? No, you, you are asking your question and confusing yourself. 
Because you're quoting scriptures out of context. You're being immoral in your question. You don't quote like that. No, you don't. So the first thing is, what is righteousness? Righteousness is right standing with God. What is righteousness? Righteousness is union with God. What is righteousness? Righteousness means equality with God. What is righteousness? Righteousness means you are free from guilt, condemnation, insecurity, and inferiority complex. Okay? That's righteousness. It doesn't mean sinlessness. Righteousness doesn't mean sinlessness. There's nothing like sinless perfection. Because some of us here, even this afternoon, you committed sin. Even this afternoon. I mean this afternoon. And some of you didn't even know when you did it. See? So, as long as you have this body, this mortal flesh, there can be no perfection in this body. That's why this body will not be in heaven. Because this body is full of problems. If it's not jealousy, it will be envy. It will be anger. It will be malice. It will be unforgiveness. It will be wanting or the other. You just look at somebody and turn your eye like that. You've just committed sin. You know what I mean. But because you are in Christ, every time you commit sin, in Christ you are washed. Because if God has to wait for you to confess, what of the ones you didn't know when you did it? Then that means you can never be fully forgiven. So God doesn't wait for you to confess. But God is committed to washing and cleaning you because he himself will present you to himself perfect. Are you understanding what I'm teaching here? So, then the scripture he now quoted was 1 John chapter 1, which was out of context. He was talk In that verse, he was talking to unbelievers. Because John chapter 1 is a letter written to agnostics and the believers. The agnostics are people who came to church who are not born again but started pretending to be part of the church. So John now said to them, if you say you have no sin, you make God a liar and the truth is not in you. Then he now said to them, if you confess your sin, if you confess your sin, he. If you confess your sin, he. So your sin is a he. Which means if you confess Christ. Because salvation is by confessing Christ. So he was just leading them to salvation. It has nothing to do with a believer who is in Christ who commits sin. Is it clear? I said, is it clear? Next question. What does it mean by whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth is loosed in heaven? Well, Jesus was talking to Peter about the authority of the church upon his resurrection. I give you the keys of the kingdom. The gates of hell cannot prevail. What you're saying is when I die, hell will not stop me from resurrection. So the day Jesus rose from the dead was the end of the gates of hell. Then he now said, based on my resurrection, you will have the keys, the authority to bind and lose. And then when you read further, the binding and the losing had to do with forgiveness. In context, the binding and losing has to do with forgiveness. People do you wrong, you forgive them. If you don't forgive them, you have bound them. You've got to release them. That's what he was dealing with. That's what Jesus was teaching Peter in Matthew chapter 16. Next question. How do we explain the reign of Christ for a thousand years? And how many resurrections do we have in the Bible? The reign of Christ is already on. They that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall what? Reign. Whose reign is that? Is the reign of Christ is already on. The 1,000 years is just metaphors. They are just communication modes, metaphorically in the book of Revelation. Then what was the second question? Um, about the resurrections. How many resurrections do we have? In the Bible. We have just one resurrection. One resurrection. And that is where mortality puts on immortality. That's the resurrection. When corruption puts on incorruption. When the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be changed. And we shall be caught up to be with the Lord. So there's one resurrection. Next question. About abortion. 
What can I do not to feel guilty of murder? God is not even aware. <laughs> You've been forgiven long ago. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. God doesn't even remember. Your sins and iniquities. I remember again no more. You're just punishing yourself for nothing. Just free yourself. And don't do it again. Just free yourself and be happy. And remember that the baby you aborted is with Jesus. So the baby didn't go to hell. The baby just went to heaven. The baby just didn't have enough time to live out God's purpose. But the baby is with Jesus. That should comfort you. And clear yourself. Forgive yourself. Look at your face in the mirror when you get home. Then when you look at your face in the mirror, if your name is Abel, say, Abel, I forgive you. In Jesus' name. <laughs> because God has forgiven you. Amen. What does it really mean to have the favor of God upon me? If, for example, I miss out on a job interview, would I say God's favor is not upon me? No. You see, that is what the materialistic gospel has done to all of us. It makes us judge things and just be looking at things in a myopic manner, in a very pinchomic way. So you went out for interview, you didn't pass, then you say God didn't favor you. No, you didn't pass because you didn't pass. You didn't get the job because you didn't get the job. Case closed. Maybe you didn't have the skills required, or maybe you didn't answer properly, maybe you didn't prepare well, or maybe you are not the kind of person they are looking for. You may have all the credentials, but your personality may not fit into the job. It's not just credentials. Sometimes they need tall people and you're short. Sometimes they need short people and you're tall. And they don't want that kind of image for their company. There are many things that make you not pass the interview. So go and apply in another place. And stop feeling bad. And oh God, why didn't you favor me? Why will God favor you? God doesn't favor anybody specially. He makes his sun to shine on the good and on the bad. He makes his rain to fall on the good and on the bad because he's a loving father. Is it clear? I don't think like that because my head is not wired to think like that. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. So what? Prepare for the next one. Case closed. I get sick in my body. Not because I'm a bad person, but because this body cannot go through this life without sickness. So when my body breaks down, I look for what to do to fix it. Okay, it's closed. I don't, I don't start checking which demon. Is it from my mother's side or from... No, no, no. I don't do those kind of things. I just fix my health and I keep going. Because if Jesus tarries one day, I will drop this body and die. Me, I will die if Jesus tarries. I'm not going to be here forever. If Jesus tarries another 200 years, I won't be found around here. No, what am I doing here for 200 years, man? You come so old that you don't even know. You can't even move again. No, I'll be gone. I'll be gone. Because, I mean, that's the way God designed it. That you don't live here forever. You play your part and get out of the place. Let other people play their parts. Is it clear? It's not because you're a bad person. It's just because the way life is. If you start seeing wrinkles on your face, don't feel bad. It's part of mortality. So it's not because you don't have favor. It's simply because they didn't employ you. So look for another one. Yeah. Please explain to us Genesis 3.22. Put it up. Genesis 3. While he's putting it up, read the next one. Please tell, us, please tell us about spiritual warfare. Are we in a war after being born again? No, we're not in a war. The war ceased long ago. <laughs> we're in rest. A man in rest is not in a war. We are in the Sabbath. Did you hear that? Yes. We are where? So the question now is what is spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare is the preaching of the gospel. That's spiritual warfare. What I've been doing here this afternoon is warfare. I've been fighting with your mind. Pulling down things that you have been taught. That are not correct. As I'm preaching, I'm pulling them down and casting them down. That's warfare. You don't do warfare on your knees. You do warfare on your feet by preaching. Blessed are the feet of those who bring good tidings. So every time you preach, you're engaging warfare. Because you're taking a man from darkness...
to light. That's the warfare. It's not some 12 o'clock prayer every night. You stand up, fire, fire, kerosene, fuel, diesel. Oh, Jesus, holy ghost. Clap your hand, shake your head. That's labor. My yoke is easy. My burden is like, sleep well, my brother. He giveth his beloved sweet sleep. Are you his beloved? Sleep well. Sleep well. That doesn't mean you shouldn't pray. But there is no time carved out for prayer. You can pray in the morning. Spend time to pray. So warfare is the preaching of the gospel. It's not fighting demons. Jesus finished them. And put them under your feet. 